not a con. Well, welcome to GIMP this, uh, wait, no, Photoshop this, GIMP that. Yeah. Uh, stylist presentation. Uh, first off, I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm actually hail from Monroe, Michigan, but uh, currently a student at EMU. Uh, I just do this as a hobby. I started this about like a year ago, getting into GIMP, just playing around with it pretty much. Uh, I'm actually a computer science major, so this kind of shows that really anyone can get into doing graphic designs and playing around with Photoshop and GIMP, and you don't need to really be going into this professionally. Uh, though on the other hand here, it's my friend Corey that I've met for this presentation, and he is going into this on the professional side, so I'll let him introduce himself. All right, my name is Corey Houston. I go to Eastern Michigan University. I'm a senior in the graphic design program there. Um, I'm a Photoshop user, and I love it. It's a, it's a great program. Uh, to me, design is something that uh, you, know, you can never, you know, exhaust all the possibilities. Uh, and I think that's what makes it uh, so exciting and challenging at the same time. Uh, well, we're going to start off with an introduction of just the, uh, of the different programs. Um, and uh, first of all, it's Adobe's uh, Creative Suite. Um, and Adobe in general, the Creative Suite consists of all of the different programs that you would ever need to create any kind of web or print uh, graphic. Um, actually, I didn't know, but they just released Creative Suite too, so this is, uh, <laughs> this is cool, I'm finding out for the first time. Um, Release party. But, uh, you know, at Adobe's the industry standard, and it's an industry standard for a reason. It's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great program. Um, and, you know, it started out just for using for photos, for editing photos, but it's, uh, it's turned into a program uh, that a lot of graphic designers use to edit images and uh, uh, do different kinds of things with, with the photos. Sure. <laughs> yeah, better. Um, I'm going to let Jeff talk about uh, the GIMP for a minute here. Uh, GIMP is kind of the uh, open source counterpart to uh, Photoshop, if you could think of it like that. It started like uh, most good open source projects did, and I believe it, it started as a, by a student in Berkeley and has come a long way since then. They actually have a history of everything on their actual site here. Uh, GIMP, it's a great reference, uh, in my opinion, uh, for anything GIMP related. They have manuals, tutorials, uh, they have a bunch of books listed online. I was actually surprised by how many books are actually in print for, uh, for GIMP. Um, most of them are outdated though. Only one of them is up to date with all the features and that's in French. So any French users, French readers, writers can read that. Um, first though, we'd kind of like to talk about uh, what actually is graphic design? What would you be expecting? Uh, most people would think just taking a picture and edit, uh, pull, pulling it into your program, and editing it, printing it off, and then that's just graphic design. But it can really range from everything from print to uh, doing web design. Uh, actually, he is the print guy, so I'll let him go into that a bit. Well, you know, print design is basically anything that you see print, you know, magazines, brochures, uh, newspapers, anything like that. Someone has to do that. Someone has to design that. Um, and the idea is, again, you know, you design it with the text and you add your graphic in uh, and it gets outputted uh, for people to read. Uh, there's a lot of things that make a good design, and there's a lot of things that make a bad design. Um, you know, if you're reading something and it's difficult to read, if the type is too small or it's not arranged in a way that makes a whole lot of sense, and you know, it's a bad design. It's not something that uh, whoever's in charge of doing that's going to be doing for very long. Um, you know, the idea is to create something that's visually appealing, but something that people can actually read too, um, and would be interested in uh, if it's like a brochure, interested in picking up if they see it lying down on a table. Uh, the more interesting it is, the more likely they're to pick it up, even if they're not really interested in what the brochure is talking about. Um, so, and that's a, that's a very cool thing about design. Is a, as a graphic designer, that's your challenge to try to get that person to pick that brochure up and find it interesting. So, I'll let Jeff talk for a quick second about uh, about the web because that's a whole another area. Uh, again, is uh, actually when we were working on this project. Uh, to, 
throw together a presentation, Corey made the example that when someone says that they do graphics, it's kind of like saying that someone does computers. Well, what aspect? So the real reason I really got into GIMP was because I was really into web design and trying to figure out how to put up my own graphics instead of just stealing someone else's off the internet and slapping it up there and calling my, my website. But with, uh, with web graphics, you have a lot of the same aspects as with you have print, except that you usually want smaller size. Obviously, you want it to look as best but as small of a file size as possible. And uh, there are many things that have uh, been done to do this. Uh, GIFs, indexing, uh, PNG, which kind of some people might think is the counterpart to GIFs uh, is open source. Uh, also does indexing uh, and many of the examples of that. Uh, JPEGs are also very good for getting small file sizes. Um, I think now we're actually going to get into some more of the specifics of the two different programs. And uh, okay, I will start off just showing you a little bit of GIMP. Uh, this is just going to be kind of an overview. So uh, we're really just trying to show off as many of the features as possible to in order to push people in the right direction. Just to really show off that it's not that hard to get into it. It's not that hard to just start getting into this. So. Uh, I made up a little example. Uh, basically, I wanted to show off, first off, how to do layers. So let's just open up. We have GIMP already open. Select a new project. And that's a good file size. And we basically just have uh, uh, just white space. Now with the tools that you have, you have your basic tools, like you might have an MS Paint or any other uh, painting programs that you so might we like. we all started, you know, MS Paint originally, so we sort of graduated to something more. Yeah, that, I don't know how many <laughs> years I tried doing MS Paint for my projects. But you have all your tool, uh, your brush selections for different size brushes. Uh, you have your color selector for all your different colors that you could possibly want. And again, GIMP, uh, GIMP and Photoshop will have a many, many of these tools just slightly called different, uh, differently. And, but the one thing that really separates this from MS Paint, you'll notice, is a lot of the extra features such as the filters uh, that you have. You can have blurring effects, you can have coloring effects, artistic effects, mapping effects. You could go through this for hours and just play with all these features and that's Pretty much, if you're going to get into either of these programs, that's what you're going to want to do, is just sit down with one of the manuals and play with all the features. Um, and also, you can find new plugins online as well from, uh, GIMP has a, a, a site on, uh, a page on their site to download any new plugins. Uh, the other nice feature with some of these more professional programs would be the extra layering that you can do. So. What many people start off doing is they'll keep editing the same same picture over and over again, and then they'll get to a certain point, and they just <coughs> would like to say, let's just take that entire last thing I did off, and they'll start undoing it and or redoing things, and then they don't quite get that one step they wanted. So it's kind of nice to be able to create a new layer. And then just start being able to draw on top of that. If you see over in the right hand side, the layering window, it actually is, uh, the red line is actually a separate layer. So you can simply just turn that off if you want to get it out of your picture. Uh, you didn't think you'd be dealing with squiggly lines today, did you? It looks like then, <laughs> That was purposeful. <laughs> <laughs> Good eye. <laughs> and so, you know, there are also very nice uh, features you can do with layering effects. Uh, you can add layer masks, which is one of my favorite things to do because uh, it makes it very simple to just uh, just have a very soft, uh, soft blending from one image to the next. So you can take your gradient tool, which will basically just make a smooth transition from one color to another and use the layer mask, which basically just takes uh, an entire black and white image, um, layer it over top of uh, the one you're working, the layer you're working with, and basically 
depending on the dark, uh, the lighter it is, the more uh, it will let through of that image, the darker it is, the more it uh, covers up. So if you just put a gradient on this, you can have it go from slightly faded to, uh, to very faded and have some fun features with that. We'll exit out of that now and we'll actually get into the project I would like to show off. Uh, those are just some of the tools that I would be using to, uh, to actually show off the project that I was, uh, was working on. Um, basically, I was kind of playing around one day like I usually do with GIMP and started noticing that if you just start applying a, uh, a simple basic pattern into the same image over and over again, you can come out with a very interesting looking texture. So using this is simply a fract uh, fractal that made by uh, GIMP, one of the plugins that it has for filtering. So if you go to filters, render, fractal explorer, and you have tons of different fractals to pick from. So I think I just use leaves for this one. Yes. And you have a very, very basic pattern that you can start off with to play with. Now with the layers, what I did is just copied this and made it seamless so it can be, uh, be set as a pattern without really looking like there's any just specific uh, lines <laughs> of where the pattern starts and ends. And then I shrunk it down in order to make just a one-tenth of the size image of the original. And then using that, I can lay out an entire pattern for it. And these are all separate layers right here as well. Using this, then, I, I lay it over top of the original image again, just to play around with it, see, see what, what looks nice. Because that's really going to be what you're going to want to do when you get into this. It's just keep playing around until you see something that you like. There's also a nice uh, rendering feature in the filters. If you go to filters, uh, artistic, and cubism, it does kind of a pixelated type, uh, type filter, only uh, a bit cleaner than what you might normally think of as uh, pixelated. It basically chops it up and rotates it and makes it look like a bunch of cubes. But it made for very sharp, uh, sharp lines, uh, which is kind of what I wanted to go for. That's a hideous color on the screen. And uh, simply by taking the same pattern and rotating it a few times, I was able to come up with a different hideous color on the screen. <laughs> and another one doesn't look as bad on the screen. And also then having fun with the layer mass, I was able to layer where exactly it would come through. You can see it's, if I take that layer away, you can see a little bit more brown over top of the green. When I put the green layer in there, it's a little bit more green than there was in the original picture. And then I still have that nice red background. So it makes it very simple to uh, just put the, that layer over over your background and just the errors that you want. And that's... Oh, that's all. <laughs> Looks okay. And then I pretty much threw it all in one image and edited the colors a little bit. I probably should have showed you the color editor. If you go to Tools, Color Tools, and Levels, it gives you a very nice window that you can basically play around with the colors. You can go through each channel of colors, go to red. Uh, anything black in the picture is going to be more red if I uh, raise the low end up. If I have the layer selected, then I go to tools and colors. It makes anything dark uh, more red. And same applies for the other colors. And these are really fun to play around with. And I highly suggest uh, playing around with colors for quite a while. Uh, actually, Corey showed me an interesting project just earlier where he was able to take uh, just an image of himself and using the levels of the colors, uh, make a very artistic uh, 
perspective of himself. Without layers. Without layers. <laughs> Without layers. So. Layers are good, but they're not necessary sometimes. Sounds like fighting words to me. And <laughs> using this same idea, I was able to come up with one of my uh, backgrounds that I like a lot, which is my fall background, actually. I think it looks like fall. I thought it did. Um, and that's pretty much my half. I have other backgrounds too, but you can, we can see those later. I'm going to pass this on to Corey to show off more of Photoshop's features, as well as the project he's been doing. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, now, the idea is that, you know, it's, it's nice to, uh, <laughs> you know, it's nice, uh, you know, starting out to play with it. Um, to play with the tools in both programs, but the idea is, is once you uh, you know are you know have exhausted you know and I guess you can never really but once you've gotten sick and tired of just messing around with stuff and you actually want to make something um, as a non-design student that might be a tough thing because you know what do you make um, you know it might be difficult to figure out what exactly you want to do with the uh, with the program. But luckily, luckily, there's uh, many different things you can do as a non-design student. Um, I was, uh, you know, when I first started uh, my design classes, you know, it, it was uh, it was difficult just to get into it without without actually knowing uh, what I, what I wanted to make. I mean, the teacher might give you a project and you'll do it, but you know, how do you go about it? Um, you know, uh, images, images. Everybody likes images, though. You know. Um, and the thing is, is that with a program, you know, like Photoshop, that's what it's there for. Uh, you can do many things with it, uh, but you know, images is something that you know everybody wants to to look at. You know, people see something, they see the picture, they want they want to know more information about what's going on. So, um, as for basic stuff um, that maybe Jeff didn't cover, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that Photoshop is such a uh, you know extensive program that you know you could actually do an awful lot you know, outside of just the, the image area. Um, for example, text, you know, text is uh, one thing that you can uh, create um, in Photoshop. Uh, text actually you can create in all of the uh, Adobe programs, but uh, make that just a bit bigger. Uh, <laughs> is there any advantage to using Photoshop to do text as opposed to another program? Oh, uh, well, actually, well, if you want to, if you want your text to look good and you want it to come out looking good when you print it, um, you should really probably do it in either Illustrator or InDesign, um, because uh, and I won't get into too much the reasons, but Illustrator and InDesign uh, use vector art. Uh, vector art's made of you know ones and zeros, binary. Um, Photoshop uses a uh, raster art, which the problem with that is that it's. Uh, very pixelated. If you zoom in on an image, it looks uh, very pixelated. And when you print it out, it, uh, uh, especially if you're printing it out, you know, on a fairly gigantic piece, it's going to look pretty pixelated. Sometimes you might want that effect, but more than likely you don't. Uh, and you know, when you're getting a grade on a project, it, you know, the teacher's not going to like it too much. So yes, you can do text in Photoshop if you must, um, but it's not something that's absolutely required. Uh, and again, I would not suggest it. But so, okay, what do you want to make? Um, that's the question. Uh, and I guess there's one thing that you, uh, you know, that everybody likes, and that's images. So, uh, the project that I uh, did this semester um, for one of my design classes, I really liked it an awful lot. And I thought, well, why not talk about it? Um, I would do it again, especially if I was stuck and didn't know what I wanted to do for a project. Because I have a teacher who doesn't tell you what you're going to make. He says, hey, you're going to construct images, then you'll figure out the project from that. So the project's actually called the matrix method. Um, it's a way of combining images into, into different images. Um, and it's, it's an interesting process that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that takes an awful long time to do. It's not something you can do in, you know, one day. But uh, the idea is that you want to take uh, an image, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, for this project, I took a lot of my own images. But you can get images out of magazines. And the idea is that you take the image 
itself, um, scan it in, you know, take a picture of it. Uh, once you got it in, you want to uh, focus on just what you want. So in this case, it's the bottle. So you want the background. And actually, a handy tool, there's many tools that you can use to get that out, but one of them is the uh, lasso tool here. Uh, it's a preferred tool for, for some people. Other people, you know, use other tools that are available. But, and I'm doing a crappy job of this right now just to move things along. The uh, thing is, once you get that all set, now you can delete it. But you don't want to delete this. You want to delete the background. If, uh, select inverse actually does that and takes away the background. Now, if you were to crop this correctly, um, you could get just the bottle. Uh, and that is the first step. There's four steps to this process. The first step is gathering your images. It's gathering um, all your images up and, you know, basically, you know, with your digital files, you're going to place four images in one file. And from there, you're going to pick randomly, you know, I'm going to combine. It, it basically, you make a square. You make, you make a square. And in each little square, then, there's a, you know, there's an image. So there's four images on a page. And, you know, you say, okay, square one, I've got four images. So, you know, like, let's say square A. Square A1 is the first image, A2, A3, and A4. So you say, I'm going to combine A1 with A4 and A2 with A3. Uh, let me show an example of what that is going to look like. Because um, it is an interesting process. Uh, so let's say you have four pictures. Um, okay, here's the first picture, second, third, and fourth. Take two pictures, combine them into one. Take the other two pictures, combine them into one. Um, and using, using the lasso tool to sort of, you know, cut into the images, uh, you know, you can, uh, I'm on the right layer here. Uh, layers, again, that's the key. Make sure that if you're going to edit something that you're on the correct layer. Um, so you cut out an image. Um, and let's say you want to place both images together. Um, so you take the image and you move it and you go to the other image then on the different layer. And let's say you want to cut that image. And all of this is just experimentation. So the whole thing is just trying to come up with a good image, you know, once you've combined you know, a couple of images. And again, this is a process that takes a while because it's not something that you're not going to see exactly what, what you want to do right away. Um, and something for our class project, we spent an awful lot of time on. I think it was like a month or something. Um, but then, you know, you figure out a way to sort of combine them into one image. Um, and, you know, so it sort of looks interesting the way, you know, once you combine it. And again, it's just a trial and error process. But uh, let's see, I have you know an example of actually an image that's sort of completed. <laughs> um, this is you know a man sitting down and his head's a bottle and there's a tiny woman in the bottle. So you're basically taking your images, you're combining into one. Um, and you know the whole process again, you know especially for people new to these programs, you know if you can scan stuff in, if you can take pictures and you learn the basic tools, you can create some interesting images out of you know out of pictures that you know. Uh, you know, pictures of actual images. You combine them into, you know, a weird image like that. Uh, and that's the second part of the process, is just doing that, and that's the process you probably spend the most time on, because that process allows you to play around. Um, and, you know, you get as scan as many images as you can, you know, and you figure out ways to combine different images. You can, like, roll a dice, you know, and say, I'm going to take, you know, image one from this with, you know, image two from, you know, another another document and combine them into one image and again you can get some pretty cool stuff um, so part three part three and this is where I introduce uh, probably the best tool in any of the Photoshop uh, Illustrator and design applications it's the pen tool <laughs> pen tool allows you to draw different shapes um, and it's a tool that, that is very you know it's very handy for creating well what I mean, you scan something in and use the pen tool, you can basically recreate it. I mean, it's it's also a process that's going to take a long time to do just because in order to get it to look right, it's not something that uh, you can just play around with for five minutes. And the pen tool is something that, you know, will take a little while longer to actually master than some of the other tools in a program like Photoshop. Um, and the idea 
uh, with, with a project like this is, um, you know, once you get the project to look like this, I'm going to just, you know, trace it with this pen tool here. Um, let's see. The idea is that you want to try to get the image down so that it's not so detailed. Um, you know, and this is the simplification, I, I, iconification part of it, I guess. Uh, basically, you know, working with the pen tool, you know, doing different, uh, you know, doing different things with it. You know, trace around it. Re basically, redraw the actual, redraw the actual image. And this is again a bad job of it, but it's just to show what I'm talking about. Redraw the image. Let's see if it's going to work for me here. I can uh, just skip ahead and show you what that's going to look like once you draw it. Um, open this in a different program. Let's see. Alrighty. Let's see if this will open. Might take a minute. But the idea, and hold the mic for me for a sec. <laughs> Teamwork, guys. All right, the idea is that once you get the image the way you are, you trace around with the pen tool and basically create a black and white icon of it. You take out a lot of the details, um, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the shadows, stuff that might not be important. And what you're left with is, uh, you know, an interesting looking, you know, sort of unidentifiable object. And it's just a cool thing to, to play around with, to do, to, you know, to just experiment with the different tools and experiment uh, with the program in general. And it's a way to go beyond just simply messing around with, uh, you know, different filters or just drawing, you know, stupid little boxes and, and, and whatnot. Um, now, the last part of our project was to, was to create these images and find a practical use for them. Which is not easy. I mean, that's the part as a design student, again, you're trying to find a way to, to, to make this into something. Because right now, all it is is just, a, is just an image. Um, and the thing is, is that, you know, the idea, again, is to follow it into a full-blown project. Uh, well, what do you do? Well, I mean, there's a lot of options. I mean, let's say you take this image um, or an image like this and you use it on a t-shirt. Perhaps you know it's a T-shirt, you know, with with some type of message on it. Maybe maybe you use this as an icon for a company company logo. So then, well, you might want no, not use this <laughs> per se. Um, it depends on what your company is, I guess. But the idea, you know, you would use it then for your letterhead, your uh, business card, um, you know, envelopes, whatever. And uh, you know, you found a practical use for it then. Now, what I did. Um, I tried to, you know, think about this conceptually. I tried to, which is a tough thing as a designer, thinking conceptually and being creative is not an easy thing sometimes. Um, the idea is I wanted to create something that would look good uh, and something that would actually function. So what I created, actually, and I'm going to enlarge the screen here if I can, get this out of the way. What I created was an actual card game. Now, all the images, you know, I placed, you know, I just created little cards for them. And as you can see, they're all different. Um, they all have different, uh, you know, shapes and different symbols and whatnot on there. And the idea, again, is to just guess what's on the card. Uh, and I created the packaging for it, the instructions. Um, it's a game that uses the dice. And, you know, you've got to, you've, you know, you've gone from, you know, finding images that you've collected out of magazines or whatever, and you've taken them into the computer, you've, you know, you've taken recognizable forms and, and, and mixed them all up, you've simplified them, you've taken out, you know, the details that don't necessarily matter, and you've taken those images and you've actually applied them to a full-blown project, something that, you know, people might actually be interested in either reading or, in this case, playing as a game. Uh, it's just a cool thing to do. I mean, it, it you know it's time consuming, but the fact is, it's not like this fourth step is really necessary. If you're not a design student, if you don't want to take it that far, you know, do the first three steps. Come up with an interesting image, play around with it, mix it with other images, come up with 
you know, some wacky image that doesn't make any sense. You know, use the pen tool, learn how to use the pen tool, you know, create, you know, sort of some sort of interesting icon and, uh, you know, just see what you can come up with and, you know, show it to people because, uh, you know, the idea is that, you know, people a lot of times are impressed, you know, by something that you thought might not be any good. Uh, and again, this is a project I enjoyed very much and from start to finish it's something that Again, it's not easy, you know, it's, it's not something that you can just throw together in one night, but it's something that if you, you know, if you spend the time to do and you learn the program and you're willing to, you know, combine the images and, you know, and, and redo things until you find an image, is that, image that's really interesting, then you can come up with an interesting method. Um, you know, it's something that, you know, nobody has maybe ever seen before. So, and that is, uh, that's basically... Um, my portion of the project. Again, I wanted to sort of take, you know, what Jeff was talking about and carry it just a step further. Because again, this is like a basic talk. It's not something that we want to get too in depth on because I mean, essentially you could spend forever learning the programs and you probably never exhaust all of the options. And given the fact that, you know, Adobe with their Creative Suite bundles all of the programs together, it gives you the opportunity to create anything you want. Um, and playing with it on your own is uh, is a lot of fun. So it's something that I enjoy very much, and I'm happy to you know to be going into you know a field where there always needs to be something designed. So the idea is that you know you you'll be able to find a job designing something, and if it's a job that allows you some sort of creative freedom, then you know perhaps you think back to this method. Um, you know, perhaps you think back to it and say, oh, you know, I remember doing uh, this matrix method, come up with some interesting images, you know. They, they want to design a new company logo or something, maybe I can come up with something good. So it's something that, uh, you know, if you have the creative power, you can come up with, with a good product. So pretty much we just wanted to do an overview, basically, of uh, just some different quick things you can do. Uh, we'll put up some of, uh, I'll bring up the, uh, the two websites again, and I highly encourage you to uh, do any kind of Google searches or on GIMP or Photoshop. Uh, any tutorials that you would find uh, can be applied to either GIMP or Photoshop, and vice, uh, they can go both ways. You just kind of got to figure out what tools uh, work with what and such. Um, definitely the two best uh, sites you can go to right now are just adobe.com and uh, gimp.org, which will give you a, a good place to start. Uh, for right now, though, we're going to open up to questions. Yes? Um, I, I guess I don't understand not being a graphic design anything. Um, what's the difference between layers and layer masks? Well, layers are just the, the stack, I guess, that you have of images. But uh, you could have an image that has no uh, transparency to it, so it could be completely opaque and cover up the, uh, the image underneath it. If you add a layer mask to that layer, then it just takes whatever black and white image you use as the layer mask, and uh, depending on how dark it is, it's more transparent for that layer. So if you have a completely black layer with a, a layer mask that uh, is whatever black and white image you want, wherever it's darker on the layer mask, uh, the layer underneath it is going to be white, it would be whiter in that area. So it's like a way of applying attributes that weren't originally there to a layer? Right, it's, it's kind of a basic way of like almost directly playing with the alpha of the colors. So you have uh, red, green, and blue, and then alpha. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Uh, <coughs> I don't know anything about creating, or I'm a terrible artist, so <laughs> when I do art, I usually just play with filters a lot, and uh, my question is, how does GIMP's filters compare to Photoshop's filters? You know, Adobe has huge resources to spend on researching you know, how to actually do filters correctly. And, you know, I mean, are they, do they look comparable, or is one better than the other? For that, I'll just I'll show you a few examples. You got to help me out with this. Yeah, man. Sure. I don't know. I don't know Photoshop. You know, like if you apply the same filter to the same image in GIMP, does it look worse than in Photoshop? Um, 
It's gonna, that's going to require a lot of plan around of both. If you want to, that's going to be requiring a plan around of a lot of uh, the, both programs. Um, I found just from doing Photoshop tutorials in GIMP that some of the t uh, some of the filters I wasn't able to find, but using other methods, I was able to reproduce what they would look like. Um, and again, the nice thing with with GIMP is that it's open source. So if you know how to develop and you know you want to filter, you want uh, a new script, I you can just write it up. <laughs> you, you don't know how to program? No, I, I don't know how filters work. Okay. Let's start with a new image. A slight difference between the filters and the scripts. The filters are actual uh, plugins that you would uh, you would write in probably something like C or something like that that would actually go through and might even manipulate even each pixel uh, according to whatever algorithms you you would want. It's you know entirely up to your coding ability. The script is going to use whatever plugins you already have in just a certain order. So it'll just use the filters with whatever numbers uh, it wants to put in. So that's the two differences between the, filter, uh, the scripts and the filters. Uh, one thing I like to do sometimes, uh, and what's really nice, is to just start off with something like uh, rendering a cloud plasma. And it gives you kind of a tie-dye looking looking image. And it's usually a very nice spot to start off with and that you can uh, you can get a very random looking picture. Uh, looks very, I guess, much more natural because it's not like a repeated image. And then you can play with the colors, colorifying it. And I think this was actually something that I was trying to do in a Photoshop tutorial. And you can't see it that well. Normally, this you would see a lot more difference between the blue on my screen. Uh. Turn the contrast up a little bit. Okay, uh, that filter is just plasma, and then you could uh, do the store. And have kind of a pond, pond looking image. And that's just some of the filters in GIMP that I could use. Uh, would you be able to recreate that? <laughs> now, <laughs> you can, yeah. <laughs> not now, but yeah, more than like that. Would be pretty easy. Uh, can you just share like the positive and negative filters that you would have? That's right. On that topic, have you guys ever had one filter that you have no idea if any other programs have ever done it? Like, was there one thing that just blew you away that they that one of the other program had? You can say no, not, that's okay. No, not really. Not that I can think of. Most most filters that if I've ever seen on Photoshop, though I wouldn't be able to do it as easily in GIMP, right. uh, I might be able to find some workaround to recreate it, uh, recreate what it did. Now, one huge difference is that, you know, Photoshop plugins that I've seen, pirated online, um, cost a lot of money as opposed to all free. Or do, are, is there any kind of um, market for people to create GIMP plugins and sell those off? I have not seen any uh, any closed sourced GIMP uh, for app plugins. I believe actually you install the uh, the the, uh, the source.c oh. file. You, uh, so it actually is a, a C uh, a dot C file that you would actually compile and install into GIMP. Uh, there's uh, I should have mentioned that also. Yes. I have sort of a related question about Jim. Um, what modes or image modes are available? Like in, in Photoshop, you can work with CMYK or more processed pretty colors. You can work in RGB, uh, index color, 
lab color uh, is another choice of grayscale. And then that, what choices are you given uh, in that realm? Uh, there's only RGB, grayscale, and indexed, uh, really for GIMP at this point. I have a similar sort of related question. Does, with a lot of open source products, they try and mirror the closed source products. Um, you know, they, they try and make it as identical as, you know, totally interoperable so that one person can go from closed source to open source. Does GIMP try and mirror Photoshop as much as possible? I mean, I know the layouts are different, but if Photoshop adds a feature, does GIMP go right out and add that feature as well, or does GIMP try and be a different program? I'm not positive on that because I don't know Photoshop well enough to really be able to say that GIMP has mimicked them. <laughs> I know a lot of people who have used Photoshop who have tried GIMP uh, really dislike it because of uh, at least version one point, uh, the one point X that it was all different windows. Every single thing that you would work with in the, uh, in the program was open in a new window. And uh, Photoshop is all generally in one window, even though it has windows inside that window. <laughs> Don't ask me how that's one window. Um, there, there is actually a project out there right now uh, called GIMP Shop, where someone has taken uh, GIMP for Mac and basically played around with what the tools are called and where the, the menu system and the basic layout to make it look more like Photoshop uh, to get people to switch over, actually. Um, I don't know why, why you'd want to switch over when you have Adobe on Mac. <laughs> yes. um, has there been any effort into making like a compatibility layer for GIMP to use Photoshop plugins? <laughs> Okay, um, since since you have to do things different ways with GIMP as in Photoshop, has there been any way to port over plugins from Photoshop or have a compatibility layer that r runs on top of it that N will... Not that I know of, actually. You should do that. I'll, I'll get on it. <laughs> Just for you. Yes? Uh, what do you guys know about fractals and like how they're made and why? Like, does GIMP have, like, is the fractal kind of like a filter? Does it apply a certain... Like algorithm or something, or is it just like an image you have? Actually, I'll, I'll uh, open up the Fractal Explorer for it in GIMP. I love filters. I use a lot of filters. What is? <laughs> you mean that's all you use? <laughs> Talk to me. <laughs> What's a uh, a real designer's opinion on? I mean, do they tend to look down on? Is filters like sort of a you know that's an amateur thing? Or? Yeah. Uh, fil <laughs> <laughs> are, are filter users like the script kiddies? <laughs> Uh, filtering is, is not something that's, uh, you know, unless you have a real good reason for it and unless, you know, you're using it appropriately for, for the project that you're working on, uh, most of the time it's just a no-no because it, 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 it's something that is, you know, a lot of times so artificial looking that it, it's not going to make people all that, you know, excited. It's not going to, a lot of times it won't really make a difference between, you know, you know making somebody like something they would normally hate. Um, you know, if you have a picture of someone you don't like, you know, it, you know, putting a filter on them and making them look different, it's not going to make you like the person any better. And so, so no, I mean, I personally don't use filters that much. Uh, I think they're cool to play around with. Um, I just don't, it, for my design projects and whatnot, I just don't have a, 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 a real use for them most of the time. I'll get back to showing the, the Fractal Explorer filter that I've just been told off on. <laughs> and uh, pretty much with this is, uh, they do have an interface for uh, the parameters and for uh, the colors. But um, one thing with fractals is if you don't have all your numbers right, it doesn't always come up with something that looks nice. Uh, just every once in a while, do, uh, do the numbers actually add up right to make something that actually looks nice. So they have actually pre-selected <coughs> ones. So, uh, this one's kind of neat. And then you can come back over to the colors, and if you want to, you can actually apply a different 
color to it. And you can see it in the preview window right there, different colors to it. Um, you can play around with that. Oh. That is for the parameters. If I were to just move one of these, it would skew it up horribly. Some of these, if I actually were to touch them, it would just disappear. Like that. That would be something that you'd want to play around with if you really wanted to get into changing those manually. You know, yes? Uh, what the files those games do, like GIMP? Uh, they actually have their own file. Uh, it's an XCF uh, file. Uh, it's just GIMP raw file. It saves everything from the, the layers, the layer mass, the paths they're drawn. Uh, which layer you're on and working with, uh, which ones are visible or which ones you've turned off. Um, as for other files, uh, there's actually a huge list of files you can save it as. Um, about the only one it doesn't come standard with that I was actually surprised it didn't was a .raw, but there is a plugin to do that. But it does PNGs, GIFs, JPEGs, uh, does uh, XPM, uh, it, all those different file formats you could have a lot. And PSD is a native function. So. It can, yeah, it can do PSD as well. Oh, yes, yeah. You can. Yes, it that can. That was actually my question. <laughs> so can GIMP read PSDs and can Photoshop read GIMP files? Yeah. Uh, and GIMP can read uh, PSDs. I, I used to save a few files in PSD until I learned that GIMP actually had its own. Uh, can GIMP can Photoshop? I've never tried. I don't use it. We'll have to get back to, we'll have to, get back to you on that. Uh, yeah, probably not. Probably not. Word can't read the book office. Oh, no, three word. Thank you. 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 Uh, that's sort of a way. What are your favorite sites for stock images? Stock images. Google search. Yeah. Uh, Google image search is very nice. The one thing is, if you're ever going to be publishing any of your work, or like actually like, uh, you'd want to be careful about any kind of copyrighted material that you find in Google image uh, search. Uh, but if you're just doing it for uh, your own personal th uh, personal projects, you're not really going to. Uh, be presenting or showing off and calling your own, it's it's pretty good. And another demonstration of adding text to an image is uh, <laughs> Corey. Is gushing. Anyways, well, Corey, Corey is editing this. Um, yeah. Uh, I'd just like to well, thank uh, Nauticon for putting this on and allowing see. us to be presenting GIMP and Photoshop to you today. Uh, I'd like to thank Mark uh, for talking me into uh, doing Same this. Here. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to thank Corey for uh, helping me do this presentation and vice versa. And uh, Corey, probably some thank yous. Well, just uh, my thank yous. Again, the matrix method thing, if anybody is still confused about what the heck it is, feel free to talk to me after the speech, um, and you know, I'll try to explain it better if I can. Uh, you know, I just want to thank Nauticon as well, because this is my first uh, talk. Uh, probably not a surprise to some people. Um, but the matrix method, it's not mine. Um, it's actually, uh, you know, I don't know who came up with it initially. It's been passed around uh, to different universities. It's, it's found in different uh, you know, uh, design books, how to teach graphic design. Um, my professor, uh, Ryan Malloy, um, gave it to us. And each time it, it gets passed down to somebody else, it's sort of, uh, they sort of change it a little bit to meet what they want the students to get out of it. Um, so, you know, I'd like to thank him just for, for giving us the project um, because it's a project that, you know, it's, it's a method that I would use in the future if I ever got stuck and didn't know what the heck to do. So, and the rest of the thank yous, you know, are on there. Obviously, I'd like to thank Jeff for willing to do this with me. Um, this is, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks.